The scenery um, which you're viewing here is of uh, Old Town Peoria. Now, obviously I'm doing voiceover thanks to the help from Jason Unruh. You know, when I was able to, I was able to get his attention so I could get the original sound stripped because while the scenery is good, I was way too stressed and I pretty much just rambled and went way off track. But this is very good scenery. Um, I'm been I've been covering a lot of Maricopa County as best I can. Um, I often I often have to make sure that the sound is working so that you know I have to make sure that the sound is on correctly. I have to make sure that the that that, that the microphone is properly connected to the camera. You know I'm starting to get better at this, but you know it's a work in progress. <sighs> you know what I find frustrating is is I'm very much in the dark, whereas all the protests are happening right now because all the people that I know or did know that could, you know, help me get to these places have pretty much, you know, gone non-active or, you know, or bo or they're boycotting me because of, you know, the slander from Dovin Mavericks or a billion other reasons that I really shouldn't just have to get into. But, um, let's talk about what's relevant here. These student protests are perfectly justified. And, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot about how, you know, oh, well, not everybody on campus is a student, you know, and therefore we should totally support, you know, live fire rounds, you know, kind of, you know, this, this is, this is the kind of shit, you know, that needs to stop this, this belief that, oh, well, they're just trying to make trouble when the truth is the genocide that the state of is the Zionist state of Israel, the, the Zionist state of not really Israel is committed and can't you know against the people in gaza it is at the level of the armenian genocide and the holocaust it's officially at that point now this this uh this uh uh this uh bill against anti-semitism actually how many people realize that that actually criminalizes judaism because judaism is anti-zionism judaism is against Zionism. It's not just that Zionism is not Jewish. <laughs> Zionism is Zionism is opposed to Judaism, and Judaism is opposed to Zionism. There are those who try to reconcile the two, and it never works. It never works because, lo and behold, when you get down into who the Jewish people are, the Jewish people are a nation. Um, who are connected together through through the mission of Tikkun Olam, which refers to repairing the world, you know, being a light unto the nations. The state of Israel is quite literally the opposite, you know, and the state of Israel, you know, um, tries to project, you know, this kind of unified image when really like, no, there's a secular humanist wing to Israel, which is constantly, you know, at war, a uh, um, social war, or conflict, not really war, but in conflict with a far right, um, faux religious, you know, government. So like the governments of the state of Israel are not in unison with one another so much as they like to present to the world. That's one thing. And then another thing is, is that, um, when it gets to the point it's at right now, they say, well, this is just Netanyahu when it's not. 
Like, they can't even make up their mind, you know, what their narrative is. But that's the thing. They do like a narrative control that's always unified, uh, which isn't real. And on top of it, you know, the state of Israel never represents the very things that it says it represents. Currently, they're claiming that they represent the ultra-Orthodox when it's actually the ultra-Orthodox who are the most opposed to the state of Israel. Before that, they represented liberal values, you know, LGBTQ rights. But, you know, we see the current government. That's not possible. It, you know, it's it's imploding from within due to its own internal contradictions. And the Jewish nation, which is a diaspora nation, is waking up to what's going on. And in mass, the Jewish people are opposed to the state of Israel. Many of these students, a great many of them, in some cases, the majority of them are Jewish. Now, this is why the very first video that um, is going to be presented here as a feature. The, the very first feature video is going to be the latest conversation between Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, the last of the, the actual last of the classical Buddhists, and Steve Struggle from the original Black Panther Party. These two make a, an excellent pair. The dialectic that they bring is very, you know, well, it, it's very essential. It's very crucial to, you know, learning what these two men have to say. So, I'm just, I'm just, I've, I've been at this for a long time, and it's good to see results. But, you know, Dr. Weisfeld's rallying cry that we have to do this as Jewish people and as Bundists is true. Dr. Weisfeld is um, very underrated, unfortunately, because not only is he literally the last of the classical the last of the classical Buddhists he he actually is woven into um, not just the Demarchist revival of Buddhism but he is actually woven into Maoism Buddhism and anarcho Buddhism he he is correct when he says we have to do this as Buddhists saying we're Jewish leftists is not enough now he didn't say that in this video but if you go on this channel um, one of the previous videos I think he said that to Ahmed from Palestine. But this is just, it, it's criminal that we're not dealing with this the way that we should. This, this is, I, I, I don't know what else I can say about this. What is happening here is horrific. I don't, I don't know what else I can say, except that the state of Israel really doesn't have a right to exist. It never had a right to exist. And the world is waking up to that. And there's a panic that the state of Israel has over this. They are panicking. They are primarily, and here's the thing, they are primarily panicking because the masses, the masses of Jewish people are against the state of Israel. That is the primary reason why they're panicking. So, you know, for all of the anti-Semites that say, oh, well, you're just making this about yourselves. This has a lot to do with us. There is a country speaking in our name, a country that is operating as a dictatorship over our lives. You know, we have no vote in the Zionist state. And on top of it, we're expected to serve them. The Jewish, you know, the, the state of Israel doesn't exist to serve the Jewish people. The Jewish people exist to serve the state of Israel, as Rabbi Shapiro from Satmar has said. And while I don't agree with everything that Rabbi Shapiro says, his particular identification of what Zionism does and what it is is still true. <sighs> On the political front, the Bund represents the Jewish people. On the religious front, Nateria Karta represents the Jewish people. And that is why that's why both Nateria Karta and Bundists are particularly kept out of the narrative. I mean, Nichiri Karta is kept in the narrative by some people, but that's because of numbers. A lot of people just don't know about the Bund, which is unfortunate. But un at the same time, many Jewish people are declaring themselves Bundists and getting into the Bundism. And I think that that's part of what's going on. In fact, this is exactly why Dr. Weisfeld has had to deal with this nonsense over just a mild vandalization that all he should have had to done if that was such a problem was pay a fine for. Because 
he is the last of the classical Buddhists, but he's not just the last of the classical Buddhists. He's interwoven to those three tendencies of Buddhism I just spoke of. He's interwoven very, very deeply with with the Demarchus revival of what Buddhism is. He's woven in very deeply with Maoism and Buddhism, and he's wove, he's he's very deep. And I would say that he largely agrees with um, not everything, but he largely agrees with the basics of what anarcho Buddhism is about. So. With no further delay, please enjoy this conversation. Pay close attention. Don't ignore. Don't treat with a grain of salt. Actually, just listen. I mean, this is this is this is peak agitation, and yet you know it, it just goes ignored. Well, it's getting harder to ignore Dr. Weisfeld finally, but this is why this is why he's being persecuted, because what he says at the end is becoming more appealing to people. So, now that presentation. Here now, and here we are again. Okay. I'm in a bit of a rush, rough shape here, you know, but things are getting better. Good. Oh, Steve, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You must be following, you know, the, uh, what should we call it now? A student revolt, you know, uh. Well, the the, P, the PFLP calls it a uh, an uh, intifada. Intifada. Yes, they call it, but I, whatever. I mean, definitely, it's a revolt on the campuses in the U.S. and it's supposed to spread around the world soon. Um, demanding divestment, uh, showing solidarity with the Palestinian resistance, um, and they're being attacked wherever wherever they are standing up and being organized and being attacked uh, physically, uh, attacked by the police. Legally now, there's laws in Congress to try and stop them from trying to make officially it a crime to um, organize in support of Palestine, saying it's anti-Semitic. But you know, that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it is around the world now. Uh, I mean, there was a <clears throat> student in camp. Oh, sorry. I, my microphone is right here. Uh, <clears throat> there are student encampments in uh, France, England, Good. Italy, Good. Need Germany. You. Yeah. You know, like it's spreading all over the world. That's good. We need, we need to spread and uh, two uh, Iranian universities have offered scholarships to any American students that are expelled from their universities. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, 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 that's very kind of them. Yeah, that solves that problem right there. You know, well, I mean, you know and they, by scholarship, they mean, you know, not only tuition, if they have tuition in the first place, but, you know, residence costs, you know, living costs. Students you know, have to live, you know. And here well, they're drained of their blood in order to get some studies done in the United States, that is. But uh, elsewhere, you know, like here in Quebec, you know, we, uh, we have, you know, next to no tuition. France, there's no tuition. United States, tuition. All over the place, plastered. And that's, um, what, makes this, and that's what makes this entire struggle, this entire situation, to me, kind of unique. Um, you know, you, these are, these are, even though there are members of the working class and I'm going to assume some poor people in, in these universities, in general, these are middle class to upper middle class students, mm. uh, because we're talking about you with the major universities in the United States are very competitive to get in. And these people who are protesting are at the major colleges. Major meaning the ones that have at least three or four grad, at least at least three or four graduate schools: mm. school of medicine, school of law, school of engineering, school of business, school of nursing, something like that. Mm. So these are major institutions, and for Iran to make such an offer, I hope that there is an there is a deluge of, of people who, who are who are eager to go. Um, one one of the demands that people have raised in this country is to overturn any suspensions, any expulsions, and any criminal charges against the students. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's very interesting, though, um, Abraham, because the way the media is playing this, let me give you an example of the, of the media play. On Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, or Wednesday night, Thursday morning, when up to 200 um, violence inflicting thugs attacked the encampment at UCLA, okay? Yeah. Right before then, the chancellor of the university said he was he was going to he wanted to end end the encampment huh. now the first attack was by the fascists yeah they attacked with with rockets fireworks knives bats um bear, bear spray um they came with the intent to harm people now Every, not everybody, but in Los Angeles, the newspapers were clear. There was no police presence for hours, mm-hmm. and this was an attack. Around this country, around the country, they said, oh, there was a clash, a clash between different, different factions. Therefore, the violence of the, of the paras, the paramilitaries, the pro-imperialists, the pro-Zionist forces, was excused as oh they're 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 just clashing hmm. since since the since the um encampment was destroyed it has been it seems to have been in the news forgotten that this was an attack hmm. and the governor himself had to cover his ass Remember, this is a state camp, a university of the of the state campus, mm-hmm. one of the top universities in the United States. And for this is okay, this is where having a, a global view forced him to say something. Just trust me, as I talk to you right now, there are lawsuits, maybe class action suits being filed against the university. I know at, at at USC there have to be the people there are more wealthy than students at UCLA. Mm-hmm. So the the legal liability they created for themselves is being totally dismissed by by the press because the press has to um, this um, create the create the image of the pro Palestinian groups as being um, disruptors as being anti Semites. Mm-hmm. As being anyone, no one worthy of being concerned about their their legal or physical safety, mm-hmm. and that's really been one of the real, um, I wouldn't say uh, down marks, but one one of the real concerns I've had re- reading the news and watching watching the watching the the political tea leaves in the United States. No one, except some people in local in LA. We're in the state, state of California. No one has condemned the attack on the students anywhere. I mean, no politicians, no one with with some political clout, will say that that, the, that people, students at Columbia should not have been arrested, students at USC should not have been arrested, students wherever in the United States. There've been up to two thousand arrests. Yeah, two thousand. That's a lot of people. Yeah, and no one is demanding their the the trials and charges be dropped. What they want to it seems as though the the federal government. I I think this comes from the top. This is my opinion based on how the U.S. works. This comes from the top of the White House, from um, the Department of Education. Whoever can control policy, they want these encampments to end. And they would do whatever they can to repress the students. But any physical attacks on the students is being excused. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, they're, 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 they're doing this and they have to be punished. So let's just beat them up. Mm-hmm. And wherever the attacks have, wherever the violence has occurred on, 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 on the screen, such as, such as, as, such as at, 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 at Emory University, where they t- took a, a professor down to the ground, smash your head against the concrete, et cetera, on the camera for the world to see. Mm. 
this has been excused. And it just shows me that at this stage of the game, at least with the student protests, the government and the deep state essentially are not, will not allow criticism of this, these violent attacks to be aired in a meaningful way by the U.S. press. Now, the L.A. Times, like I said, local media in L.A. have said something. They have to say something because it's so obvious. Hmm. But, and the governor said, well, he's not talking about the violence. He's talking about, oh, well, you guys, you guys took too long. Because he, he, his university doesn't look too good, does it? No, it does not. So there's a lot of embarrassment, I think. They're trying to cover it up to hush it up. They want to, let, they want to call for a quote, an investigation, which will accomplish nothing, as we all know. Every investigation in the United States is always a cover-up, be it, be it the assassination of um, Kennedy. King, King murder was never investigated. I mean, mm -hmm. anyone who is any, all these investigations are always a whitewash in general. Um, but that's my statement to those to our viewers that the U.S. state is determined to betray the pro-Palestinian cause as as um, disruptors to education and um, um, anti-Semitic. And that's that. That's they're sticking to that line. Um, yeah, that's that. That's the that's how I see the situation right now. Yeah, so true. And all of that, in spite of the uh, the proof, the video that I circulated, even that shows the Zionists, fascists, attacking the section of the barricade at UCLA that had written on it "Jews for Palestine." Okay. <laughs> And so, and they shouted to the, you know, the Zionists, you know, we're Jewish. They said, we don't care, the Zionists said, you know, in return. Well, I, 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 want, I want to say something about this. This is a civil war, a Jewish civil war, you know, that's coming down to. Exactly. Um, I think that's a very good point. But I want, to, I want to argue that those who attacked the demonstration students, those who attacked the demonstration who were not police, I'm of, I'm of the uh, belief that they are members of the Proud Boys and other violent groups. And here's why. Um, about 40 years ago, uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina, a group of anti-racist communists were having a rally in, in the black community against the KKK, against the KKK terror. It was, it, it was, it was an organized demonstration. The police had a, they had a permit for a march, et cetera. The police went on lunch around noon. The Klan showed up at 12.10 and, and opened fire on the, on the demonstration. It was very convenient the Klan showed up right when the cops left uh -huh. because the Klan knew they, they had been working with the cops and they found out where and they, when the cops were going to be leaving. Mm -hmm. I, I'm of the opinion that the, that, the, that, the U, that the UC LA administration and the UC police knew these these people, these young men had assembled and, and were attacking the demonstration. There are reports that they were even on site and just watching it, go, watching things go down. So the violence that came up to UCLA, to me, was, was sanctioned and endorsed by the administration and the powers that be. And I'm just saying another example occurred a few decades ago when the police disappeared or are not present, and then one side attacked, then the, the fascists and the paramilitary types attack um, the demonstration, and nothing is done to them. Nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, so far, it's not even been a conversation piece. Like, mm -hmm. Okay, they, they can just do this, mm -hmm. and that's the danger of the of this kind of of this kind of event in terms of the rights of people to even be quote unquote protected by a supposed neutral body, which isn't neutral. The police are not neutral. Yeah. But they, they, they essentially said, at least on the college campuses, if, if, if say you want to demonstrate, your safety is on you. 
because you know because we're 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 gonna allow the fascists to attack you and once we feel it's, it's enough has been done then then we'll come in and attack you because what they did the next day is the the cops came and it tore down the them tore, tore down the encampment mm -hmm. the next day the next day again the goal was to get rid of the encampment not to defend the right of the students to demonstrate so yeah. that's always been the goal to stop the protest at all costs and yeah. and if somebody wants to come um throw rockets and pepper spray you and bear spray you and attack you oh well that's just what it took to uh, get rid of you and if mm -hmm. they got injury oh well you just got injured yeah. but i tell you right now and this is there will be individual lawsuits if they have already been filed and that's yeah. kind of right now. that's kind of where it is but that's kind of where it is right now uh, i don't know of any organized fight back by the students around this issue of police police um police and the uc police department and the state compliance with the attacks i'm hoping this becomes a narrative they will will um up, will take up because it has to be shown it has to be exposed that this is what happened it yeah. wasn't a clash it was an attack yeah. and if the state is allowed to get away with this then there then there will be other attacks that's all yeah this, this was planned and i the violence the use of knives and the bear spray um speaks to not just the fraternity boys on college campuses, but somebody else. That's yeah. all. Yeah, and then they complain about outside agitators. <laughs> well, there, yeah. there, there, there they are. Yeah, those are the way they are, outside agitators for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I see. I saw a video even of uh, University of South Carolina, the uh, academic uh, uh, head of the Department of uh, Jewish Studies, you know, gray-haired grandma type lady, you know on the front line there with the cops who came to attack. Wow. And I think I hear her say, you know, fuck off to the cops. Next thing you know, she gets dragged out of the mass of people, demonstrators there, pulled along, thrown down to the ground, you know, uh, handcuffed and taken away. You know, this grandma. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 no, no. Uh, there was to be, see, this is, this belies the rhetoric from the state. Oh, let's de-escalate the situation. Let's de-escalate. No, there was no attempt to de-escalate. None whatsoever. Mm. No, there, was no, there was no discussion about de-escalating. Especially when you grab a senior, okay? He shows just mm. disrespect to the elderly. Mm. That that sends a real signal that you don't care about any anything, nor... They don't nor, care about anything at all. No, they, no. They, don't care. they don't care because... You know, it's just, it's just how, it, and it also says this is not a civil society. When it comes down to it, violence is the way that they speak. Violence, sanctions, and death. And yeah. that's what they want. And that's what the yeah. police, especially in Texas, mm. in Texas, when they just came at those students, just, and they, they had done nothing. The rights of the students is simply being attacked. And that's what's going on. Mm. And... But a lot, I'm, I haven't really checked the squad's website, you know, the so-called squad, yeah. just, to see, just to see what they say, just to see what they say. Yeah. I haven't checked, um, I haven't checked um, CARE or other Muslim groups, just to see what they say. But it, I'm curious to see what they're saying, because that's what's occurring here, mm -hmm. is the support for the right of self-determination for Palestinians. Yeah. That support cannot is not supposed to even occur and a lot but on large measure it is occurring and all they can do is attack it and physically and, and now try to pass laws that make make such uh, make such manifestations and anti anti-semitic so we need to call on people around the country around the world to step up bring this to your workplace bring this to your to your school go out there and support the demonstration or if, or, or create your own your own manifestation of support for Palestine, because the Palestinians are looking, the world is looking, and the fact that there are other encampments and other protests around the world seems to me saying that this this is something that people of the world are seeing that they must support. 
So I I, I think it's it's it, it's a it's a great development. It troubles the ruling class. It troubles the ruling class when mm. they shut down schools oh. early. Mm. When they shut the campus down early, so it's it's over it's over for the year. That mm. means they're they're that they're that they that, that, that they feel that they feel troubled behind this. Yeah. That they can't control it. Yeah. So they take away the campus. They take away the campus as a place that of a place of organization. Yeah. That's what that's all about. Yeah. Well, you know, they they remember what happened during the '60s. You know, with the students' revolts against the uh, war in Vietnam. And uh, they tried to stop that, you know, but it didn't work. They even sent in the National Guard yep. and started shooting students. And yes, that's when, did. you know, uh, you know, that's when um, the, uh, the the uh, American uh, war in Vietnam failed. You know, you know, at that point, you know, when they were shooting down students, you know, they, they and, and exposed, you know, that. Uh, what they were doing, you know, to the Vietnamese, you know, is what they were willing to do to Americans as well. Well, then that was too much for Americans to take. So, uh, you know, that really helped to bring that war to an end. And uh, that's why I think Biden, as he was walking at a press conference and wouldn't answer any questions about the student revolt, you know, finally had to answer, you know, when some journalist shouted at him, do you want to, or do you support bringing in the National Guard? And he had to say no. That was it. You know, like no, no way <laughs> can he afford. You know, to let the national guard in there. You know, and they, of course they would come in there. You know, to use maximum force, and they would kill a few students in order to intimidate. You know, everybody else. Right. And he knew that this would be the end of his administration and the Democratic Party for sure. So well, he said that's no. A, that's a, that's, that's a, it. That's all. That's, that's very good. That's very good that you mentioned that because what if someone oh. So far, no one has been killed by the by the fascists and the pro zionists or by the police. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm going to say, I hope I'm wrong. I think inevitably someone will be killed. Not because I want it to happen, but I do think that at a certain point, someone is going to let is going to quote take take the gloves off. Mm -hmm. We might have a Chicago. 1968 scene at, at one of the demonstrations. So I'm wondering what is the state doing to avoid that? Because eventually someone is going to be killed. Hmm. This could easily have happened at UCLA. It could easily have happened there. Easily. The level of violence that was inflicted for hours by the by the by the Zionist um paramilitaries on the students, the use of uh the of the, of the weapons the knives, the bats, the bear spray, etc., the firecrackers. I'm hoping there are no deaths, but I do think it's going to happen eventually, not because I want it to happen, but because, this, you know, like, just like you said, the, I, I, don't think, I don't think that Biden wants that on his hands, especially since these students are not, they're not going to be voting for him for president. These people can vote, and they're not going to vote. So he really has lost. Oh, he may have lost his election right here. Yeah, yeah. Because you no, know, this won't, these people are not going to vote for him. No, they're not. Yeah, they're going to say no. We'll we'll just sit this one out. Mm -hmm. We're eighteen to twenty four and twenty three. It's our first election anyway, maybe or second, mm -hmm. and we're not going to vote for you. We're now we're not voting for Trump. We're not voting for you. And he may have lost. This may have cost him the presidency. This. Yeah. 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 This. Yeah. This yeah. because this this is organization. Is that people if people are determined enough to go and risk getting suspended, risk getting expelled from school, risk getting arrested, voting is nothing for them to miss. Yeah, I think it's that election. So I think I think it's over for Biden. Let's Biden get and remember also, um, Abraham that the Palestinian that the Air, the Arab community in Michigan and other parts of the country. Oh, yeah, they've already yeah. said that they're not going to vote for Biden. They've already yeah. shown they're not going to vote for him. Yeah. So he's really in trouble. This may be this may be the nail in the coffin. The, the demonstrations and the attacks of demonstrators, the attacks, may have been maybe the coffin that caused the election. I don't think these people are going to vote for him. Yeah. I don't think. I mean, I may be wrong, but even he, even here in Montreal, you know, during my vigil at the Jewish Community Campus. I received a number of threats, you know, so 
the the level of violence you know is is threatened to be increased yes. and these people are capable of doing so and uh, yes. they think that they can get away with it as well you know because well, they're, they're supported better. there's even you know a, a law now you know like what they call it the anti-semitism awareness act i yeah, think it's it, been well, passed no it is not a law yet it has been passed by one house of the congress the other house, the other house has to amend it and pass it, and then Biden has to sign it. But it has been passed by one body. Yes, it has been created as as a bill yeah. that that can become law if the Senate approves it, and then Biden signs it. So yes, it is possible. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, it is, it, it, it's not it's not law yet, but the fact that they passed it so quickly, yeah, is is to me reminiscent of what, ha what happened in Germany. The yeah. way that the movement there has literally been crushed. I yeah. mean, when people who come to speak at conferences are banned at the airport from entering the country. Mm. Okay. And to see that a set, and this shows also, I think people should really um, um, become aware of the connection between the colonization of the Palestinian land and the attacks on the Palestinian people. The reason that, they, that you have these attacks on the Palestinian people is that the Israelis had basically established a fascist society over mm. the Palestine, in my opinion. How else can you explain the home demolitions? Mm. Where in the world are homes demolished mm. of people of a certain uh, ethnic group? In Israel, that's it. In the United mm. States, you know, um, the so-called the, the 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 natives were moved move, moved up the land by force. Mm. So home demolition, the whole issue, I mean, everything about the the laws. That uh, cut that allow the dispossession and oppression of Palestinians. To me, to me, that's a that's a fascist state. Yeah. So yeah. The colonization of the of the people, theft and violence, violence against the people to steal the land, and now the mass murder through the 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 post October seven period by the Israeli by the Israeli defense forces, the bombing of the Iranian embassy in Syria. Mm. It's a major military aggression. Mm. That's just, I mean, that shows Israel had no fear of doing yeah. it. Mm. Okay, so that's what's happening at campus, and that's why it's very important for our viewers to <clears throat> become involved, to support, to be vocal, to get organized, and fight back because we need to maintain our movement. There, there's going to be ebbs and flow in any struggle. But we have to be determined to fight and determined to win. Yeah. I think when you refer to a fascist state, I mean, uh, you refer to a fascist society even. And I think yes. that you're right. You know, it's not just a fascist government. It's not yes. just a fascist state that has right. been treating right. Palestinians, right. you know, to, to, to this, right. you know, racism for 75 years, yes. 76 yes. years now. Yes, yes. But, but the whole society, you know, the whole educational system, you know, uh, the way that they pluck, you know, students out of high school and shove them into the military right away where they're indoctrinated to obey orders and nothing else and not to think. You know, this is a really, you know, like very advanced fascist society. Yeah, and it, their it, supporters, it, 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 you know, uh, are willing to, you know, like attack you know, us uh, protesters, you know, everywhere else. The issue that they're making this is, is, you know, whether it's anti-Semitism or not, okay? They're making it into an issue of anti-Semitism. They're saying that all the protesters are anti-Semitic. Even the Jewish protesters, you know, they try to dismiss the Jewish protesters, you know, by saying that they're just self-hating self self Jew. yeah, Jewish self people. Yes, exactly. I, I think if they want to make it the issue, you know, then I think the Jewish student protesters, you know, have to have to stand up and speak out, you know, even more so than they are now. You know, so far they've just been. Uh, oh, good. So far, uh, you know, what we have seen is uh, just uh, students there as supporters. But I think the students, Jewish students who are protesting, have to take uh, a step forward and speak into the mic and tell everybody, you know, that this is not an issue of anti-Semitism, that they are there, you know, because they're protecting the name of the Jewish people against a state that claims to be representing the Jewish people, that does not represent, uh, you know, even a majority of the Jewish people, you know, who don't even live in that state, don't have a vote in that state, have nothing to do with the government of that state. 
yet they claim to be speaking in the name and acting in, on behalf of the Jewish people. This has to be thrown out the window and has to be smashed here and now. And uh, uh, this, this is a very, uh, very, very good point. I'm glad I, I got the idea of the fascism. I was listening to a discussion last night of a, a scholar from some university. He talked about he talked about Palestine. He talked about Ukraine. He talked about just um, how the word fascism has been made to think just Italy, just just um, Germany, and just Japan. But there are in, there are indicators of what of what um, a fascist society and government would be linked to, and he linked it to the colonization of a pre of 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 the others peoples by another government. And you're right, the society of Israel has become a fascist society. I mean, we can't we we have to not mince words here. Yeah. What's occurring yeah. here with consent, with consent of the so-called governed. Okay. Yeah, sixty eight percent support, you know, of the Netanyahu government still. So, so let's say, maybe they want to get rid of Netanyahu, but the government there and what they're doing in Gaza, you know, like they're still supported by sixty eight percent of the population yeah. there so you know like I, is... I i i would like to come back to something you just said though the need for the jewish student to step out to step out mm. and mm. i think you're right about that i think you're uh we need to create some spaces so that can happen yeah because right now it's just a protest and it, it's seen like it's portrayed by the state as a mob and yeah. um somehow we have to create the, the space and encourage these students to anonymously, maybe we cover, we do, we do security on their faces and that, you know, this kind of thing. But however we have to do it because this has to be said yeah. that what's happening in Israel, what's, what the Israelis are, have done and their government is doing to the Palestinians does not represent the best interests of the Jewish people around the world does not that represent that. It's not right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, right. In the minutes that we have left, you know, I would just conclude that, you know, the Jewish students, you know, so far, I mean, coming out, you know, as a Jewish student, you know, but they have no idea that the Jewish Bund, you know, long ago criticized Zionism, you know, for failing to resolve the, the Jewish oppression in Europe, failing to oppose fascism, and in fact, collaborating with fascists with their own interests in setting up a state apparatus, which is representative of basically the Jewish national bourgeoisie and nothing more. And everybody else is going along with this? No way. You know, those Jewish students have to become historically minded and speak out. And they have to speak out in the name of a Jewish Bund movement. They have to become advocates of a Jewish revolutionary movement now and saying that they are opposing Zionism and that they right. are a, a force, a movement you know, and even, a, you know, a political movement now, which is regenerating as the Jewish Bund, as the Jewish Socialist Bund in particular, and then that will speak in the name of the Jewish people and not, you know, the Zionist state. That's what they have to defeat. They have to defeat the idea that Israel is representing the Jewish people. And I think they can do it now. They're strong enough to be able to do that. But they're not even aware of their own role. They're not, not even aware of how crucial their role is. And this is what I hope, you know, this video, amongst others, you know, will help to, to correct. I agree. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so let's get this out. And uh, I look forward to uh, the uh, movement uh, growing over the coming week, because it doesn't seem like the Zionist state is willing to back down. I mean, they're letting more food supplies in, but, you know, like, it's still a trickle. You know, 325 trucks, even, you know, like, is not you know, anything compared to what they need, you know, which is 600 trucks a day. So, you know, the starvation is still undergoing and there could be, you know, mass famine happening as well in spite of uh, all the little efforts that are being sort of made and the words, you know, but that Blinken comes up with. Keeps on repeating, you know, encouraging, you know, the, the caution to, to deal with, you know, like civilian populations. You know, like, what's the point of even saying it? You know, like, he knows that they're not going to listen to him anyway. You know, it's just... Play acting, you know, this is role playing. It's pathetic. The damage, the damage has been done, and the damage will continue to be done un, un, until until the occupation and 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 the siege on Gaza ends and reconstruction begins. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right.
Next up, we have something which came out on May 3rd, 2024 from Luke Dublin, the Anglesist. Hey, it's your boy, the Anglesist. Hey, I'm looking like a Metal Gear Solid villain at this Palestine uh, protest. Uh, yeah, I'll blow it if anything happens. I'll blow it if anything doesn't. You know how it is. Uh, first time at a protest in a while. I'm excited. So everything's good so far. I managed to secure myself a tent, which is nice. Banners around. Makes sense. Fuck uh, UOM for supporting Israeli genocide. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, so this is the angles. Is um, been here about a few hours now. I found a tent. Gonna stay here overnight. Nothing really's happened besides just fucking media people. Um, yeah, TK Media were fucking around I've gotten footage of them before like there was the Kill the Bill stuff where all that happened but like basically people who are not media trained should not be speaking to people going around with cameras putting stuff on Facebook because it will make you look a knob a lot of the time because like I don't even know if they're nefarious people they could be but if they if they are nefarious they will chop up everything that you say to make it into usable clips that make you look like an insane person. So, I'm now manning the food, which is actually pretty fun. A lot of people have been very generous in donating. We actually have so much that we're not sure how much of it will spoil. I don't know, like, I'm having a... This is actually really impressive and I'm very like, I'm very happy with like what they've achieved and well I guess I'm a part of this now what we've achieved. Wait. <laughs> I'm just happy. Went for a wee break. Honestly people need to wear fucking masks man. I mean like people are filming all the time. It's that fucking TK Media people. I've worked with them before. I don't necessarily think that they're bad actors. It's just that like the, it, that that footage is out there man. Like. I mean, I've been caught out at times, but, like, it's important that everybody be aware of, like, that you do need to be masked up a lot of the time, especially with shit like this. They'll label you a terrorist, they'll label you whatever they need to label you. Like, you gotta be aware, you gotta be street smart about this shit. Why isn't this working? That's a genuine blooper. <laughs> Lucky for me, I managed to get some sleep, but, uh... It wasn't the easiest to sleep. Now oh, well. Should be fine. It's almost six o'clock in the morning. So it's 5.45 in the morning because it's it got very cold. But um yeah, nothing really happened. Nothing bad happened anyway. It was fucking freezing though. Um The process has been going pretty well, actually. Which I'm happy about. I've found that generally I congregate at this mess tent. Oh. Need to put the lid on. But yeah, now everything's going well so far. Besides that media thing that happened. Um, I'm going to try and come back for a few more days. I don't know if I'll stay overnight like I did today because uh, I don't know if my body can handle that anymore. I'm not the spry, you know, uh, scout leader. Not scout leader, I wasn't the scout leader. I'm not the spry young scout that I used to be, but you know, is what it is. I'll try and come for a few more days. But yeah, no, honestly, this has been a fucking eye-opening experience in it. Like, the UOM people who set this up should be fucking proud of themselves because this is fucking, this is fucking good and positive and and I hope that this is very successful if it ain't, no big deal but I feel like it's a it's a good form of demonstration and that, you know, like, we should take notes from this sort of thing here I am, 6am, in front of the starry plow I was actually surprised this flag was here, but that's neat. Um, 
I found this a noise dating experience. Um, I thank BO and what for everything they've done. Hope to be here a few more days, but this will be probably the only night to spend over because I've got a lot of I got a lot of like finance shit to sort out. But like I have had a fucking lovely time, even if I am dog tired. <laughs> a night of rough rigs and Palestinian support. So yeah. See you, comrades. <laughs> Colors on the streets, red, white, and blue. People shuffling their feet, people sleeping in their shoes. There's a warning sign on the road ahead. There's a lot of people saying we'd be better off dead. Don't feel like saying am to them, so I try to forget it any way I can. Keep on rocking in the free world 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 This next video this next video comes from the leaders of our generation that's right the rabbinite with the mazora the only one that can be said to have the Maz the mazora with them as well as obviously all other haradim that you know are in proper association with them Naturia Karta International This video addresses solidarity for the protesters who wish to see a liberated Palestine and you know the confronting of the problem that which is zionism this video of solidarity from naturia karta international came out on may 2nd 2024. assalamu alaikum i apologize i don't have a voice i lost my voice last night in front of city college in new york and then at 11 o'clock in the evening in front of Colombia. I'm here together with my group from Montreal and we are here to support the brave students of McGill. Brave people who managed to overcome the massive propaganda and this ongoing intimidation. This is a bravery that should be a lesson for the rest of Canada and the rest of the world. When we are seeing this intimidation, blaming everyone who speaks up against the Israeli crimes as anti-Semitic, this makes no sense. This is nonsense in ignorance. But this is dangerous in ignorance. This is unfortunately ignorance, which is leading to the continuation of violence, the continuation of crimes, which leads to death and destruction of everyone. Anti-Zionism is in no way anti-Semitism. <laughs> Judaism and Zionism to begin with is not only not the same, but a total contrast. <laughs> Judaism is a religion, a religion only, no politics to it, a 3,000 year old religion versus Zionism, a relatively new, 
just over a hundred year old political movement which does not represent the Jewish people and does not represent the Jewish religion. Yeah. According to Judaism, all that Israel stands for is forbidden and criminal. A the very philosophy of Zionism to build a sovereign homeland for Jews happens to be in total contrast of basics of Jewish religion, even if this will be in total peace with everyone. But when this happens in Palestine, by killing and oppressing these untold violations of international law and of Jewish law, this is a true desecration for our people and a true rebellion against God. Anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. When we are witnessing crimes taking place, we as righteous people should stand up, condemn it, and stop it, regardless who the perpetrators of the crimes are. Yeah. For us, Jewish people, it happens to be embarrassing that unfortunately these crimes in Palestine are carried out by some people from Jewish descent, supposedly in the name of us all. Shame. Shame. This conflation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, Judaism and Zionism, this is not only doing injustice to students on campus who deserve the freedom of speech. This is not only doing injustice for the people in Palestine who deserve our voice here in the free world to speak up for them. But this is also injustice for the Jewish people. Yes. Because when you conflate Judaism with Zionism, you make a statement that God forbid all Jews support these crimes, which ends up being a statement that all Jews are accountable to all what is happening. Now in addition to the catastrophe inflicted on the Palestinian people, this is causing so much danger to the Jewish people as well. The organizers said before we shouldn't approach the protesters across the street. Forgive me, I have to address them. They are standing across the street and they are speaking about October 7th, about hostages. They are talking about suffering of Jewish people. Yes! All of us here today are pained when human beings are suffering. But while we are concerned about people hostage, we should be concerned about people unjustly imprisoned in Israeli jails. If we are concerned when Jewish people face danger, yes, we should be concerned. But at the same time, we should be concerned about what's going on for decades, where thousands, tens of thousands of people have been murdered recently, and so many more have been murdered and oppressed for over 75 years. clear. All of us agree that all humanity should be safe. Yes. But don't be fooled. And those people across the street should wake up. 
The state of Israel is not the security of the Jewish people. The state of Israel is not here for the people. The state of Israel is here for a political movement. On the account of everyone in its way. Regardless whether they are Palestinians or Arabs or if they are Jews, they would be willing to sacrifice Jewish lives and they did this all the way through. So many books to read on this, so many parts of history to be aware of. It's not the time now to elaborate. If we are concerned about what happened October 7th, if we are concerned when Jewish people are in danger, we should wake up and learn what's the cause of all of this. What is the underlying cause to the... The underlying cause to the endless cycle of bloodshed where everyone suffers. We should listen to Secretary General of the United Nations who said a couple of months ago that what happened on October 7th didn't happen out of a vacuum. It happened as a result of decades of occupation. None of us are happy with what's happening. But we have to face reality. We have to be smart. And we have to know and learn to be able to figure out how to reach a better future. <laughs> the Zionist crimes committed to Palestine is not only a catastrophe for the Palestinian people, but a threat and a danger to the Jewish people. Yes. When the Zionist movement is intimidating students here in McGill or students elsewhere, listen to this. This is not gaining support or safety for the Jewish people. This is exacerbating anti-Semitism. If we truly want to see a better future, we should realize what the root cause of all of this is. The cause of the conflict is not the difference of religions. We had differences of religions for the longest time, and we lived in peace prior to the 1920s, before the Zionist movement. Before the beginning of Zionism, Jewish people were respected and protected in other Muslim countries and in Palestine. If we want to go back to old history, if we want to restore historic peace in Palestine, we have to stop this occupation in its entirety. From the river to the sea, Palestine should be free. Let me tell you, I'm sure all of you know, but I'm talking to some people behind me. Let me tell you, from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free. It's nothing about the annihilation of the Jewish people, God forbid. Don't you use assumptions what those people using this slogan mean. Did you ever take your time to approach the students here in these tents and ask them, 
What is this slogan all about? The, this pro-Palestinian solidarity movement has nothing against the Jewish people and nothing against the Jewish religion. This is against a criminal movement a destructive movement, an anti-Jewish movement. This is against occupation and crimes, and this is about the freedom of the oppressed people who deserve a better future. And this is about the safety and security of the Jews. <laughs> in McGill University, pleading with the administration here, pleading with the government of Canada, and pleading with the world, please, for the sake of everyone, wake up and speak up for what is right. <laughs> the students today, throughout the world are taking the lead and we all should follow. Once we can have this occupation stop and we hope that this ends peacefully with no more suffering of anyone, at that time we can hope to see once again that beautiful peace that did exist in Palestine. Let's hope we see this in the future, soon in our days, inshallah. God the first time that he joins us. He's joined us many times in many protests. He's been walking with us. Our brothers at Vittorio Carta have been with us every single week. Every time we called, every time Palestine Every time that Palestine called, they were there. Every time the Zionists went out, they were there to counter them. They have been in solidarity with the Palestinian people since the first day. And they are true proof that this is not about religion. This is not a conflict of religion. This is a battle between those who hold on to their humanity and the inhumane fascists that took over Palestine in 1948. And as he said, the students have taken the lead and we should all follow. And one thing that I want to shout out here, from here, I want to give a big thanks to the students for leading. So together, one loud voice. Thank you, students! on the front lines and you know it's not easy because they will be the first people to get targeted and as our brother said in our last protest here Sunday they might lose their degrees here but they do win the degree of dignity and humanity shout out to our students for being the first
front line. And we promise to never give up on them and to be their front backbone at every step and push and fight with them to make sure that we give our best. And uh, here is another, this is another video from Nichiri Karcha International, which came out on May 3rd, 2024. Alright, we know that the U.S. government is making a concerted effort to trick us into believing that being against this genocide means you're anti-Semitic. But we know better than that. We can see past their propaganda, we can see past their lies, and we know that the right thing to do is to oppose the horrific crimes against humanity that the state of Israel is carrying out, and which the U.S. government is paying for. So I want to invite up Rabbi David Weiss to the mic. Let's go. Hi, Solomon. I pray to the Almighty to bestow upon me his truth, his wisdom, that I may be worthy of conveying his message and sanctify his name, inshallah, bring peace to the world. We came out here because it is critical, it is incumbent upon us as Jewish people to stand up, speak out, to let the world hear that they are being conned that the Zionists, that is, the, the movement, the ideology behind the occupation in its entirety, it has an ideology behind it that's called Zionism. And they are masquerading in the name of a religion of Judaism. But they are not Judaism. They are antithetical to Judaism. They are contradictory to Judaism. They are totally the opposite of what Judaism is. They are using this beautiful religion of the 3,000 years, a religion that my grandparents, and going back for 1,000 years, 2,000 years, we died for. Just recently, my grandparents died in Auschwitz because they were Jews. And we are proud of them. We are proud of these Jewish people who are God-fearing and stood up and said we are ready to die for our religion. These Jewish people, ready to give their lives, are now looking down from the heavens and they are watching how their ashes are being besmirched, how our name, how our holiness and whatever they gave their lives for are being sullied by a group of people that are rebelling against God, that are rebelling against the Jewish religion. They're using the blood and ashes of the people who died in Auschwitz to occupy, to kill, to steal. And if anybody dares says anything against them, they accuse them of being anti-Semitic. There is nothing more revolting Judaism is a religion of 3,000 years to be subservient to the Almighty, to emulate God, just as God is compassionate, you must be compassionate. The Jewish religion teaches us to show gratitude for good done to you. Jewish people, throughout our history, the last thousand years, Jewish people were harassed, were murdered by blood libels, by the Inquisition the Crusades that they tried to forcefully convert Jews, and if they didn't convert, they burnt them. And the Jewish people were banished many times from European countries. And the Jewish people, where did they go? The Muslim and Arab countries took us in, and we flourished amongst them for hundreds and hundreds of years without any human rights groups to protect us with a distinctly different religion which was no impediment to coexistence until recently living under the Ottoman Empire 
Jews and Muslims, Jews and Arabs together with a distinctly different religion. We babysat each other's children. We lived in peace and harmony. We respected each other. And all of a sudden, a movement came from Europe called Zionism, a nationalism, godless, a movement that stated, we want the land, we want a piece of property in order to further our plan. They were thinking of Uganda, of Patagonia, and they chose Palestine because it was practical, not because of godliness. They picked Palestine because they knew they would tell the Christian evangelistic Christians that the children of Israel are getting back the land of Israel. They used it for their efficiency, for their convenience sake. They went. They turned to Palestine, but they proudly announced that, oh, this is a nationalist movement. We're a democracy. You're not bound by the Torah. You have nothing to do. You don't have to keep the laws of God. So they're full of hypocrisy. From one side of the mouth, they tell people, God gave us the land. But then they tell the world, they tell the people living there, oh, but you don't have to keep the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments. You don't do what you want. They're full of hypocrisy. Why are you calling yourself a Jewish state when you are blatantly, clearly disrespecting anything that is Jewish? You are simply using our religion, our name, to stifle the voice of humanity that is opposing your occupation. Unacceptable! They brutally beat in 75 years Jews who are standing in the streets of Jerusalem and saying, what are you doing here, they say to the Zionists. Why are you here? What are you doing with our name? Why are you oppressing the people of Palestine? And they get arrested, boys and girls, because they refuse to serve in their army. All the old men and young children, they get brutally beaten, arrested, and assassinated. Because why? Because we are proudly standing up for our religion and totally denouncing the existence of this occupation, the Zionist state of Israel, this immoral, illegitimate state. Our communities are Jewish because we are Jewish. We oppose the Zionist state of Israel. We are, if that's what you call anti-Semitic, so be it. We are proudly this new anti-Semitic. We are proud of this. But who is the true anti-Semites? The Zionist state of Israel. They are the personification. They are the personification of anti-Semitism. Look what they're doing. They're killing, they're murdering Palestinians. They're brutally beating and murdering Jews who are standing in opposition to their occupation. They cannot accuse us of being militant. Our communities never, for 75 years, we don't carry guns or knives. They have no excuse for their brutality to the Jewish communities. Yet they do this with impunity and the world is silent. Why? Because the world is being conned, being misled, and intimidated. The world is fearful of saying one word against this holy cow, against this terrible, terrible, unjust state of Israel because they're flaunting the Star of David. They're using the Star of David as, as a symbol, the menorah, the name Israel, which is Jacob. They're using our name simply to intimidate and silence the voice of righteousness. Courageous doctors, courageous people who are humane, they chose a field to help people who are suffering. Students who are looking eagerly at a future to do what's right in the world, who are courageously standing up. But whenever anybody tries to be outspoken, they are immediately bashed down and accused of being anti-Semitic. There's nothing more revolting than that. We watched for five years and more how Jews were murdered in Auschwitz by the Nazis in Europe, in Treblinka, and so on, and the world was silent. 
Today they make memorials, Yad Vashem, memorials. What is this memorial about? That we dare not be silent, that we dare not be silent at injustice. And then Rwanda comes about and the world is again silent. And then they turn around. President Clinton said if there's one thing he's embarrassed about is what happened on Rwanda under his watch. What are we going to say our leaders after the passage of this terrible massacre of what's happening in Gaza? Why are the, what are they going to tell their children? Why were they silent? Why were they silent? It is an insult to common decency. It is an insult to common sense to watch this and accuse the people who are opposing this as being anti-Semitic. It is an insult to common decency to stand up and support this occupation. It's blatantly murder. It's genocide. They're torturing people. You have trucks full of food standing right across a few feet away from people who are dying and crying of hunger and starvation and thirst and pain and they're not allowing in medical aid, food, and they're doing this in the name of my religion. How revolting, how unacceptable. It is an insult. It is an insult. This is not anti-Semitic. Supporting the Zionist state of Israel is anti-Semitic. When somebody, will oh God forbid, do something, God forbid, against the Jew, nobody will buy it anymore when somebody says he's an anti-Semite because they watered it down. They made it cheap, the accusation of anti-Semitism. It is an evil entity, this occupation. They've destroyed Judaism, and they are destroying the, the protection that was built when we, the courts want to say something is anti-Semitic. They've destroyed the whole word anti-Semitism. They are the personification of anti-Semitism. Let's get this straight. Let us not be silent. and they are brutally beating and killing Jews. They are also creating a rift. They are exacerbating around the world anti-Semitism because people are accusing and looking at Jews as if they are in support because they're Jewish, as if we are supporting this terrible crime, this Nakba, this, this catastrophe. I go to the airports, I travel around the world, and I'm embarrassed because I see people looking at me and I think they're thinking that because I'm very religious, I support this horrific state of Israel. So we want the world to know this Judaism and Zionism are distinctly opposite. They are contradictory. And you, and we want the world, everybody, let us remember the Almighty brought an end to the Greek Empire, to the Roman Empire, when the USSR was sending people, the millions of people, to Siberia and murdered people because of religion. That ended. This, the apartheid, ended. Nobody believed it will end. It ended. The world gave respect in the United Nations to, the, to South Africa and the ones who stood up in opposition to the apartheid were called terrorists. The, most, the, the ambassador of South Africa was called His Excellency, although they were practicing apartheid. Today, nobody would dare create a state called an apartheid state. Everybody would know it's evil. One day, the state of Israel will also be recognized that it is patently and totally evil. It will happen. <laughs> We have to know. Let us pray to the Almighty with His compassion to bring a speedy and peaceful dismantlement entirely of the occupation designed the state of Israel. But till that day comes, let us dare not be silent. We must speak up. We must stand up and do what we can to help the people of Gaza, the people of Palestine. Let us not be silent. And if you are intimidated, turn to the religious communities 
in our Quds, in Mayashari, in Jerusalem, or right across here in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the largest concentration of religious Jews, or London, or, or in the Argentina, or cabin of the very religious Jews, because they're Jewish and practicing their religion, they oppose entirely the occupation of the Zionist state of Israel. So take courage, stand up, continue, don't be silenced, you'll be proud of yourselves 20 years from now, what you did and that you were inside. Let's continue. Until, until the day we will see, inshallah, a free Palestine, a free Gaza, people of Gaza, hear my voice. El be my Palestine, El be my Gaza. Our hearts are with you, Palestine. Our hearts are with you, Gaza. Inshallah, viva, viva, be Palestine, viva, viva, Palestina. Let us be Viva, viva, Palestina. Lucha, lucha, Palestina. Lucha, lucha, Palestina. Viva. Judaism, yes. Zionism, no. The state of Israel must go. Judaism, yes. Zionism, no. The state of Israel must go. Judaism, yes. Zionism, no. The state of Israel must go. Kipple, Judaism, yes. Next up, we have uh, we have now something from Democracy Now!, which came out on May 1st, 2024. Hundreds of students at Columbia University and City University of New York were arrested last night after hundreds of police officers carrying shields and in full riot gear raided Columbia to break up a Gaza solidarity encampment set up almost two weeks ago that has inspired similar encampments in over 40 universities across the country, including CUNY. Students at Columbia took over Hamilton Hall a day earlier, after the school began suspending students who refused to leave the Gaza Solidarity encampment. Students renamed the building Hinz Hall in honor of Hinz Hind Rajab, a six-year-old Palestinian girl killed by the Israeli military in Gaza. The police raid began after Columbia University President Manu Shafiq sent a letter to the New York City Police Department calling for the encampment and Hamilton Hall to be cleared. She wrote, quote, I have determined that the building occupation, the encampments and related disruptions pose a clear and present danger to persons, property and the substantial functioning of the university, unquote. President Shafiq also asked the police to remain a presence on campus until at least May 17th, two days after graduation, to ensure, she said, that solidarity encampments are not reestablished. Columbia's graduation is scheduled for May 15th. Hundreds of officers entered the campus through the main gates and encircled the encampment inside last night. Police also pulled a truck outside Hamilton Hall, extended a ladder to a second-story window for a stream of officers to climb into the building. Further uptown from Columbia, at the City College of New York, police in riot gear raided the Gaza Solidarity encampment after the administration made a similar call for the police to enter campus. Scores of students and CUNY community members were arrested. Overnight, the department shared a video on social media showing officers lowering a Palestinian flag atop the City College flagpole, balling it up and throwing it to the ground before raising the American flag. Over the past two weeks, police have swept through other campuses holding peaceful Gaza solidarity encampments across the country. Over 1,200 students and others have been arrested. In a moment, we'll be joined by two Columbia University students who are on campus during the police raid. But the first, Democracy Now! was on the streets last night outside Columbia. 
I'm Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! We're standing at 113th and Broadway. It's about 10.30 at night. The riot police have lined up here, and it is a complete frozen zone from here up to Columbia University. We understand that they've moved in on Hamilton Hall, that the students have occupied, and we understand arrests are underway, though we haven't seen it. There was a group of protesters here, but they say they're going to do uh, jail support. They're going down to one police plaza. Let's see if we can find them and ask them why they're out here. What's your name? I'm Jeannie. Uh, I am an organizer with Warriors in the Garden. I am a first generation Korean American. I am a shamed alumni of NYU. Uh, we are out here as people whose ethnic roots originate in the global south uh, to stand against settler colonialism because no matter how it looks in every form, it kills. And we will not be complicit anymore. And this is a very historic moment where our, our youth in our country are leading the revolution, and it is all of our responsibilities to not put that, to not, to not just be like, oh, they're so brave, but to be, in, to have that incite something within us. My name is Sam. Uh, I'm an organizer, and I'm here to show support for the students. I think that uh, I've been a I've been pro-Palestinian my whole life, as is my family. Um, I'm Iranian, and we have always found the liberation of Palestinian people to be essential to our liberation as Iranians and everybody's, you know, collective liberation. We're standing at Amsterdam and 113th Street. It's yeah. about 10 30, 11 at night. Why are you here? Uh, so, I'm a Brown University alum, and uh, as you know, one of our own, Hisham Awartini, was shot. And also, I have a Palestinian friend who told me that uh, for his for speaking out on Palestine, he's been doxxed. I mean, and he's been kicked off campus. He's lost his housing and food, and he has no family here. But he feels the need to speak on it because his cousins and family members are under the rubble right now, and he can't reach a lot of his cousins. And so, knowing that you know, uh, there's not a lot of de degree of separation between Hisham and I and our other colleague that also lost family members and has been doxxed and kicked off campus. This is the least that we can do to support our friends. Is this why you're wearing a mask even though we're outside? Absolutely. And we're not wearing a mask because we're scared, but we're doing this because this is what our predecessors have told us this is the right way to protest. And this is what we need to do to protect ourselves while also speaking and standing up for what's What's true? So I understand there's an encampment at Brown, too, and there's a slogan, from Columbia to Brown, we yeah. won't let Gaza down. Yeah. Have you heard the latest from there? Uh, so today, actually, Brown University passed a resolution uh, to, uh, in order to compromise with the students' encampments, that they're going to vote in October on divestment. So. I think that's a big victory for the student encampments, for the 41 students who were arrested, and also for the students who were doing the hunger strike, uh, as you may know. So, yeah, the the vote, the agreeing to vote on this investment is a big step for the student organizers, and they're very proud of it. And I think that's the least we can do as alum to support them. We've just spoken to some people who are supporting the students now. The bus of arrested students is coming through. Back up. Are these the buses? The buses students? are coming up. Please back up. These are Please the arrested up. students. Please back up. Thank are they you. buses? I'm not sure what's, who's in the buses. I know the buses are leaving. Please back up.
arrest right now. The police have moved in and they're t on top of someone. The police have arrested someone. People are shouting shame. He's on the ground. What's your name? Back up. Back up. What's your name? Over 230 students and their allies were arrested at Columbia University last night when the Columbia president okayed the presence of the New York Police Department and their raid of the university. Uh, dozens of others were arrested just 20 mile 20 blocks north at City College. For more on the police raid at Columbia, we're joined by two guests. Cameron Jones is a Columbia student with Jewish Voice for Peace. He was outside Hamilton Hall when police pushed everyone into nearby buildings and stormed the hall. Cameron is a 19-year-old urban studies major. He's joining us here in studio. And Jillian Goodman is with us, a student at Columbia Journalism School covering Columbia's ongoing student protests since the first days of the encampments. She joins us via video stream. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, Jillian Goodman, uh, no relation that we know of. Um, Jillian, why don't you describe what happened on campus? I mean, what's really fascinating here is the Columbia J School, the journalism school, overlooks the police raid. And, in fact, uh, Columbia journalism students and other students who were um, covering this event were told by police they'd be arrested if they didn't stay inside. Jillian, thanks so much for joining fact, us. Absolutely happy to be here. Um, that's correct, Amy. And in fact, the only reason that we were able to have access to campus, many of us in the journalism school, is that we had slept in the building the night before. They had restricted campus to only those students in residential dorms. So the only reason we were able to witness what we were able to witness is because we had stayed in the building. Um, when police arrived, they were extremely efficient in removing all eyewitnesses, including legal observers. Um, myself and my colleagues at the journalism school were were pushed with police batons to our backs and corralled out of the space. Uh, so we were not able to witness the arrests head on, but some journalism students were able to remain in the building to overlook the side of Hamilton Hall. But they were extremely clear and efficient that they were not to have any eyewitnesses, including the majority of press, during the time that the arrests were made. And Jillian, was there any warning beforehand uh, or any sense that the that the arrests uh, were coming? There had been a sense for a few hours as police gathered outside. I would say that no one knew the exact moment they were going to come in, but we knew pretty clearly within about a 30-minute window. I think there was a tremendous sense of trepidation, but also resolve on campus that I saw from a lot of the organizers. Um, we were also served an emergency alert from emergency management that went throughout to all Columbia students, um, issuing a shelter in place warning in the hour before the arrests happened. And so most students were corralled into their dorm by campus safety. And that was our tell that the, that the arrests were imminent. Uh, we're also joined by Cameron Jones of Jewish Voices for Peace. Cameron, what did you see uh, last night? Yeah, so I was also one of the students who was forced into a nearby building once the police arrived on the scene. And it was very clear that the university and the police did not want any witnesses to the police brutality that was going to take place. They even pushed medics and legal observers into nearby buildings, preventing them from doing their jobs. And then we got a slew of footage from onlookers that protesters were pushed and shoved, individuals were thrown downstairs, one individual was left unconscious for a few minutes, there was also the police using tasers on peaceful protesters, and also using a smoke bomb inside occupied Hind Hall. So it's very clear that the police used very aggressive and very violent tactics to suppress peaceful protesters. And what about you? You were outside. You didn't occupy Hamilton Hall. You were at the encampment. Do you face suspension? 
As of now, I am not sure what the university will do. Unfortunately, the university has arbitrarily suspended dozens of students already, so I would not be surprised if I do end up facing suspension, unfortunately. The response of the students to the president, although on Friday saying she would not call New York police on campus, calling in those police who raided Hamilton Hall last night. Yeah, so the president is definitely acting in bad faith, I would say. She really seems to be doing anything in her power to suppress student activism on campus, and that includes bringing in violent police to violently arrest hundreds of people. And it really appears as though the president has not learned her lesson from arresting people a few weeks ago, because the students only come back with more fury and with more intensity in regards to our activism. Chairman, I wanted to ask you about the role of the faculty. Many of the faculty condemned the last raid uh, or the first raid that occurred a couple of weeks ago. Uh, were there faculty out there trying to interpose themselves between the students and the police this time? I did not see a substantial faculty presence, but we have had faculty very present at the encampment acting as security, and we have widespread faculty support in terms of our opinions towards the administration. Faculty is on our side in condemning what the administration has been doing. And Julian Goodman, uh, you have both the President Shafiq and New York City Mayor uh, Adams painting the takeover of Hamilton Hall as a takeover by outside agitators. What was your sense of who is inside Hamilton Hall? Yes, so I was there the, the night that the occupation occurred. Um, there's no way to know exactly who was involved, but I, I know firsthand that there is a large student presence. And also the thing that surprised me the most was a massive student support outside. There was a human chain linked arm in arm to protect the building that was 200 students strong. And those are people that I know to be students of Columbia and Barnard in a large majority. So I think that mostly this is an effort by administration to distance these actions from the students, though I know that they are deeply resolved and in support. Let me ask Cameron Jones. Uh, Columbia student has sued Columbia um, for creating a hostile environment against Jews. You're with Jewish Voice for Peace. I want to turn right now to a clip. This is Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson uh, facing heckling and booze when he came to Columbia University a few days ago, calling for President Biden to call in the National Guard to bring order to the campus where the students set up the encampment last week. He also called for Columbia President Manu Shafiq to step down. Columbia students criticized Johnson's visit. I am here today joining my colleagues and calling on President Shafiq to resign if she cannot immediately bring order to this chaos. As Speaker of the House, I am committing today that the Congress will not be silent as Jewish students are expected to run for their lives and stay home from their classes hiding in fear. Um, if you can talk about that as a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, Cameron. Yes, so I think as a Jewish student on campus who represents a group of dozens of Jewish individuals, I would like to note that Jewish students have been part of the protest movement on campus since October, and there have been dozens of Jewish students who have been arrested for pro-Palestine demonstrations. So I think it's really important to recognize that there is a large anti-Zionist Jewish voice on campus, and it's also important to recognize the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism is a, is a political ideology while anti-Semitism is in regards to Judaism, which is a culture and a religion. And it's important to know the distinction between the two. And I think oftentimes in the mainstream media and, and on campus, there is a conflation of the two. And it's really important to recognize that there has been an intense amount of hostility towards pro-Palestine protesters on campus. We have faced harassment. We have faced physical and verbal intimidation. I myself have been doxxed and have faced death threats online. I have been harassed on campus by multiple individuals. And explain what you mean by doxxed. Yeah, so I've had my personal information published online, including pictures, social media, my LinkedIn profile, et cetera, in which people can message me death threats and email me 
horrible information. And the university has done nothing to protect pro-Palestine voices and has been really cracking down on anyone who is standing up for Palestinian rights. And this really just shows how Columbia University is using similar tactics that the apartheid state of Israel is using to crack down on Palestinians in occupied Palestine. Hmm. Well, we're going to leave it there, but I do want to ask um, Jillian Goodman, uh, the president of Columbia, the president of Barnard, has already had an overwhelming no-confidence vote by the faculty. President of Columbia says she's asked the police to maintain a presence on campus through May 17th, two days after graduation. Um, what are you expecting? As uh, we saw yesterday, the campus almost completely shut down. Professors had their IDs canceled. Students couldn't, unless they lived right there uh, on the campus, get in. Yes, I think those actions shattered a sense that there is free and open access to our own resources and our own campus, the ways that they were really effectively able to bar anyone from that. I think there's really profound disappointment and anger coming from Shafiq's decision to retain a police presence on campus, as that has consistently been an ask, I think, from all sides, is to remove the police presence. And that is often what creates a threat and intimidation of violence much more so than the protests on campus. I watched the police at around 2 a.m. load the encampment into a trash compacting dumpster, and I watched the community guidelines get crushed. And I think that, to me, was the perfect moment of seeing what that effect can be of having that police presence on campus. Jillian Goodman, a Columbia Journalism School student, covering Columbia's ongoing student protests since the first days of the encampments, and Cameron Jones, Columbia College student with Jewish Voice for Peace. We thank you so much for being with us. Long live the student Antifada. And this will conclude with another video from Democracy Now! Um, and and it, it came out on February 16th, 2024. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We turn to Gaza to a case that's reverberated around the world. Two weeks ago, January 29th, six-year-old Hind Rajab climbed into a car with her aunt, her uncle, and her cousins in Gaza City as they prepared to flee to the southern part of Gaza. But as they were in the car, an Israeli tank approached them and opened fire. Hin's 15-year-old cousin, Laon, called the Red Crescent for help. These were her last words recorded on the call with a Red Crescent dispatcher. Hello? Hello, dear? They are shooting at us. Hello? Hello? They are shooting at us. The tank is next to me. Are you hiding? Yes, in the car. We're next to the tank. Are you inside the car? Hello? 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 That was 15-year-old Leon's last words, killed along with the rest of her family. The only one who remained alive was six-year-old Hind. Wounded, she called the Red Crescent back, pleading with the dispatcher to be rescued. Come take me. You will come and take me? Do you want me to come and take you? I'm so scared. Please come. Please call someone to come and take me. Okay, dear, I will come and take you. After seeking approval from the Israeli military, two emergency workers with the Palestine Red Crescent, Yusuf Seino and Ahmed Amadoun, went to try to rescue six-year-old Hind. But dispatchers lost contact with the medics. Nearly two weeks later, Israeli forces finally withdrew from the area, and on Saturday, Hind's surviving family ventured back to the neighborhood. They found Hind dead inside the car, alongside the bodies of five of her family members. The car was riddled with bullet holes. The bodies of the two emergency workers were also found in an ambulance nearby, appeared to have been killed by Israeli fire just yards away from the car. This is Hin's mother, Wissam Hamada, after she learned of her daughter's killing. 
My heart is completely destroyed over my daughter. Two weeks, they killed them. Two weeks, they were in that car. I've told the world from day one, please go get Hind. God is the only one sufficient for us. Everyone failed us. I will tell God on the day of judgment about my daughter. I swear I will never forgive you or any human involved or any human rights organization. For more on this case, we're joined now by Nabal Farsakh spokesperson for the Palestine Red Crescent Society, joining us from Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Nabal, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us everything you know about this case. Good evening. Thanks for having me. We at the Palestine Red Crescent were heartbroken and devastated again after learning the fate of our colleagues Yusuf Azino and Ahmed al Madhun. The ambulance was found bombed just meters away from the car where Hind was trapped. The story began after we have received a call from the uncles of Hind and Layan, who live overseas, reporting that there's two little girls are still survived after their uh, family car was targeted by the Israeli tanks. He gave us a phone number, we called, and then Layan picked up the phone, and this is the call which you just preview it. Layan was killed while she was uh, over the phone with our dispatch center, and then we have called the number again, and hence, which picked up the phone. And she was supposed to turn out, to turn into six years in, in May, and now she has lost her life. Over three hours, Hind was over the phone with our dispatch center. She was repeatedly seeking help, repeatedly appealing for our teams to come and pick her up and pick her up. It took us all of this time, over three hours, in order to coordinate safe access for our ambulances. And once the green light was given, the ambulance headed to the location. And upon its arrival, uh, they have reported that there is a green laser on them, that the Israeli occupation forces pointing a laser on them. And then we have heard a sound of gunfire or a bombardment. It wasn't that much clear, and the connection was lost. For over 12 days, we were uncertain regarding the fate of our colleagues Yusuf and Ahmed and the little girl hand. We were thinking that they might be arrested there was so many questions, like if they are, were succeeded to rescue Hand or not, because basically also they have confirmed that they can see the car of Hand and they were so close to Hand. It is just devastated to learn that Hand passed away alone. She was killed alone and scared, and our rescue teams were, were only meters away from her. And can you explain the weapon found by the ambulance? We're not sure regarding uh, the weapon found um, next to the ambulance. According to reports, um, it is, uh, an artillery shelling U.S. made uh, was found next to the ambulance, which was bombed by the Israeli occupation forces while they were trying to save six-year-old hand. It's just so much sad to see paramedics losing their life while they are trying to save people's life. What was the fault of Yusuf and Ahmed? Their fault was they went in a rescue mission to save a six-year-old girl. It was a coordinated mission, and the green light was given, and the Israeli occupation forces intentionally bombed the Palestine Red Crescent ambulance, which has clearly the Red Crescent emblem on top of the ambulance and from all the sides. There was no way or no option to be by mistake. It is an intentional targeting. Since the beginning of the war, we have lost 14 PRCS members all of them were killed while they were on duty trying to save people's life. And what does the Israeli military explain to you, given that you got permission for your rescue workers to go rescue Hind as the world heard her six-year-old pleas for help? 
up to this moment, the Israeli military didn't comment or reply at what happened. And even during the 12 days, we have tried repeatedly, even through the ICRC, to uh, ask the Israeli occupation forces regarding what happened to Hand and the rescue team. And all the time, they were mentioning they don't have info regarding this incident. To turn out, after 12 days, they have bombed the ambulance, and still they don't have info regarding the incident. I want to turn to another case. Um, the Palestine Red Crescent has just posted new video online as evidence uh, that their ambulance was shot at and its staff were, quote, brutally assaulted by Israeli forces. Um, PRCS said the video was taken around a week ago and shows a Red Crescent paramedic with two black eyes sitting in an ambulance um, that is pockmarked by bullet holes. The organization says the attack happened as the ambulance crew was delivering oxygen cylinders to Al Amal Hospital in Gaza. It also stated that Israel had claimed they had transferred the oxygen cylinders to Al Amal Hospital. Can you explain what took place here in this video that we are watching? Yes, for over a week, um, Al Amal Hospital was run out of oxygen. This has resulted to uh, three of our patients died because of the lack of oxygen. After we managed to coordinate getting uh, oxygen cylinders to the hospital via the ICRC, our ambulance heads to bring the oxygen cylinders from Nasser Hospital and to transport them to Al Amal Hospital. In its way, the ambulance, Israeli occupation forces, opened fire at the hospital, and they insult and beat our, uh, our paramedic, who was trying to uh, move and transport this uh, oxygen cylinder, which is life-saving for our patients. This is not the first attack, because at that moment, also a week ago, the Israeli occupation forces raided Al Amal Hospital. They have destroyed medical equipment, and they dehumanized the medical staff patients and their companions. They arrested nine of the Palestine Red Crescent members from Al Amal Hospital, including four doctors and a nurse. They have beaten the staff, denied them, uh, not allowing them to drink water or even to go use the toilet, and they tie their hands on their backs. The situation is extremely dangerous inside Al Amal Hospital. We are still extremely worried regarding the safety of our teams who were arrested from Al Amal Hospital. Today, two of them were arrested, were released, but seven of our PRCS members still detained up to this moment who were arrested from inside Al Amal Hospital. Al Amal Hospital is under besiege and continuous attack for the 25th day. Today, Israeli occupation forces targeted the second floor of the hospital with artillery shelling. It gladly uh, only damaged for two of the nursing rooms, but there was no injuries among the staff or the patients. But the situation remains very dangerous, with Israeli tanks are in front of the hospital, besieging the hospital, continuous gunfire and bombardment surrounding the hospital. No one is able to go in or go out of the hospital. There is no food, no water, extreme shortage of medicine and medical supplies uh, inside the hospital. The situation is beyond dire. Nabal, I asked you about Israeli response. I want to ask you about the U.S. government response and how important it is. This is a clip of State Department spokesperson Matt Miller in a news conference on Wednesday. He was questioned about the killing of six-year-old Hind and her family by a reporter from The Intercept. Prem Thacker. It's been over two weeks since Israeli forces attacked uh, Hindar Arab's family, killing her aunt, uncle, and cousins, leaving her trapped alone in her vehicle. We heard her pleas to the Red Crescent Society. Two medics were sent, all to be blown up allegedly by Israeli forces. I wanted to ask about the status of the inquiry into this, just because it seems if the Israeli government, you know, which seemingly does have a pretty sophisticated operation, is prioritizing this, and they don't already know which soldiers to interview, for instance, they have. Red Crescent calls, timestamps, the location of the Red Crescent staff to, you know, uh, question and rely on plenty of material to figure out who exactly to 
um, inquire with and to figure out who to hold accountable. Um, so I want to first ask about the status of this. Sure. So um, I think that question is appropriately directed to the government of Israel. I will say on behalf of the United States, we have made clear to them that we want that incident to be investigated. They have told us they are investigating it. Uh, it's our understanding that investigative investigation is not yet complete. You should direct questions to them about where it stands. But we want to see it completed as soon as possible. And as I said from this podium several days ago, uh, if accountability is appropriate, we want to be uh, we want to uh, uh, see accountability put in place. Nabal Parsak, we just have 30 seconds. Um, that's the State Department spokesperson. How important is pressure from the United States and Israel? As you talked about, a U.S. weapon being found near the um, a shelled ambulance. It is extremely important. The life and the story of Hind should not be end in this way. We're talking about six years old girl. She was trapped in her family car for hours after everyone was killed and targeted by Israeli occupation forces. During this, even two paramedics who went to rescue the six year old girl was also targeted and their, their ambulance was bombed. We need to see actions happened and to put Israel accountable for committing such crime against a six-year-old girl and civilians who were in Nabal their Bursa, car, along with we thank you so much for yeah. joining us. Spokesperson for Palestine, Red Crescent.